So our impact of uh, COVID-19 on adult education at Baker Ripley has been uh, still to, to this very day uh, tremendous. We, uh, when we were first told we would need to start um, teleworking, it was on, on a Friday, March 13th. 3 p.m. <laughs> and uh, of course, we we were in the middle of a registration period. So um, we did not know how this was going to pan out, what things were going to look like. And obviously, throughout that whole transition and the way the city responded to, to COVID, we lost a lot of students. And uh, when I say lost, I just mean people simply had different priorities, right? Um, so the first thing uh, that uh, kind of was the immediate impact was that we noticed that our, our students were not answering calls. They, they were not, uh, you know, even reaching out to see if there were any classes. There was just a whole mute point, right, uh, where um, kind of no, nobody knew exactly what was going on, what is going to happen, um, and, and how to, to react to it. For us as a team, it also meant that we needed to adjust to something completely different. So not all of us were set up to work from home. Um, we, we had to all of a sudden start thinking about pieces like, is everybody set up? Does everybody have a laptop to take home? Does everybody have an ergonomic chair at home to, to work from? And so on. So uh, it was really a sudden uh, kind of impact that, that uh, transitioned our team and the students uh, we were serving as well. In, in terms of using distance uh, learning tools, definitely XPRIZE uh, experience and the experience in Burlington English Pilot has helped us a lot in transitioning into an online environment, not just because um, the existing students we had already knew how to use these platforms and were comfortable uh, using them, but also because then they were sharing uh, these pieces as well with their families, with um, their neighbors and friends and recommending this program. So when we went into transitioning into um, a, a virtual environment and saying student, to students out loud that these are the curricula that we would be continuing to use, they were more inclined to continue the virtual classes. And we've really seen um, a great benefit from having been exposed to these uh, online learning tools and having dipped into uh, the, the distance learning platforms uh, before. It certainly helped us, first of all, save time on research because we already knew what products were good, what we could afford and, and um, secure for our program, and because our students already knew knew how to use these platforms and were comfortable with them. So, um, and uh, it, that definitely helped the, the whole transition and just bringing both staff and students on board with the, with the online environment. So in terms of how we transformed as, as a division uh, at Baker Ripley, uh, we definitely made major strides in, in terms of first making our staff comfortable with the online environment, picking out our platforms, our curricula, our distance learning partners, uh, and all of that. And then uh, we took our basic services, which was ESL for jobs, uh, school to work uh, model, or GED preparation classes, and really took that up a notch, right? Uh, so we integrated digital literacy across all of our programming and launched a, a separate digital literacy program that would run concurrently with the other classes that was a major change um, we, we made in our services. And then all of our programs um, started with a two week orientation in digital literacy training. These digital literacy trainings then covered all of the tools necessary for a student to be successful in the class, such as using Zoom, using WhatsApp, using distance learning platforms, and using email, right, as a main uh, source of communication between the teacher and the student 
student, between the program and, and students um, and so on. So in terms of our services, we, we've really laid out a foundation and continued what we started with, with the XPRIZE and, and distance learning uh, partners from before and really made a solid foundation in digital literacy, first of all, both for our staff and our students. Um, and then, um, Kind of transitioned into continuing to provide the services that we um, that we were known for to our community members, which was mostly ESL classes and GED preparation classes. Um, in terms of the future of our services, I see digital literacy as a great and super important uh, potential for our program. So we are partnering also externally with other funders uh, to increase our digital literacy programs, not just at that basic level, but also working towards transitioning into workforce training classes and uh, supporting uh, credentialing and um, uh, uh, upskilling for uh, maybe, uh, you know, some jobs for the future, such as, uh, you know, basic um, IET uh, um, uh, credentialing or in the IET domain, right? Um, we all know that now all that people need are is going back to jobs, right? So we want to make sure that our program is equipping them with the necessary skills and training that they need to go back into the workforce. And that's going to be a big um, focus uh, moving forward uh, for our programs. So my main suggestion for any CBO out there that is just now starting to the transition is first to, to don't think that you're late. This is still going on and uh, there's still a lot of need out there. Uh, even uh, now that we're virtual and, and that we can serve more students, so to speak, because we are not limited to the brick and mortar um, uh, buildings, uh, we also see that a lot of people are staying on our interest list because simply we don't have that capacity still to serve them. As we know, Houston is the area that has so much need uh, in terms of adult education classes. So um, my first suggestion is don't be afraid. Don't think that you're late to anything. Um, and don't be afraid to try it out, right? So there is still a lot of need out there. Um, our main kind of lessons learned is that you do need to do your own research. The good thing about the situation now compared to seven months ago um, is definitely that right now there's already a lot of best practices in the field that you can learn from. Um, there's a lot um, out there back in April, there was just, we were all so overwhelmed with information, right? Um, right now, anyone starting out services would just need a, a solid project plan, right? Starting with what you have, what you need, identifying subject matter experts within your own team and starting with, with your own teams and seeing what it is where you still need expertise on and what it is that you can do internally. Um, definitely assessing uh, you, uh, you know what what you already have and the the communities that you serve and what the main need is there uh, and then trying to to meet that need uh, in the community would definitely help when we originally started we assessed all of the students in our database uh, we gave them individually uh, calls and asked about more than just adult ed need, right? To see where they were at and how we could support them. Um, staff training, definitely crucial, uh, definitely important that staff is comfortable with technology because technology is not going anywhere. And this is something that the state and all of the providers in the field have been repeating for years. And uh, we've all been heading in that direction. I think COVID just kind of sped up the, the whole process. Um, so really very comfortable to, to um, a, a very important to be very comfortable uh, with technology with training your staff um, and then providing that once you know what your platform is, what your curriculum is and what your assessment is and what you can move forward with, then starting that orientation for your clients and your students um, and slowly setting them up. Every beginning is hard, but I feel like right now, a lot of the community members are also 
adjusting as well, right? And uh, taking an online class does not sound so radical anymore like it did seven months ago or a year ago, right? So I feel like in, in that way, there's for all these CBOs that are just starting, there's a lot of um, good foundation that's already laid out. And I think um, if you just try, you'll, you'll, you'll see that uh, it's not as scary as it might sound. So in terms of assessments, um, our program being a state and, and federally funded program, uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of which assessments we use. For our ESL classes, we use uh, Best Plus and Best Literacy. Um, and for our HSC classes or GED preparation classes, um, we use uh, TABE 11 and 12. Um, TABE publisher, DRC, and ACAL, the publisher of, of Best Plus and Best Literacy, have adapted um, as well and um, adapted these assessments to uh, be able to proctor them remotely. Um, CAL, however, adapted only Best Plus 2.0, which is the oral assessment. Best Literacy assessment has not been updated. Uh, so at the moment, we do not administer it. We only administer Best Plus 2.0, which is an oral assessment. And it's um, actually very easy to administer. The test itself takes about 10 to 15 minutes with each student. We proctor it through Zoom, one-on-one -on -one with each um, student uh, who comes in. And um, we've come to learn that if we have a moderator in a Zoom call who then uh, sends uh, students with the testing proctor staff into breakout rooms, that that kind of system works really well. So we started scheduling students in 15 minute increments. They come into the main Zoom room, moderator kind of gives them a brief orientation into the testing process and explains what's going to happen and then sends them to a breakout room where they are one-on-one -on -one with a testing proctor. The testing proctor, as for all of you who are familiar with the test, um, the test does have some pictures that a testing proctor needs to show to the student, which is done through sharing screen um, option on the testing proctor side. As far as TABE is concerned, we are uh, also administering that remotely. Both TABE 11 and 12 have been adapted. Students can take it online. Uh, we also do this through Zoom. So in a similar manner, we have a moderator for each testing session who is there for any um, technical issues, uh, staff uh, questions, student questions, just to kind of help everybody navigate the situation. When it comes to tape, the student to testing proctor ratio is one to five. So per publisher guidelines, no more than five students uh, should be tested at the same time when it comes to uh, tape. So what we do, we send one, three or five students into a breakout room with a testing proctor. The testing proctor uh, gives them their test tickets, which contain their username and password to log into the secure portal that uh, DRC has um, adapted for this purpose. Um, and then uh, the rest of the testing session really um, kind of uh, boils down to observing the student as they're doing the test. Um, the pr testing proctor cannot see the screen uh, of, of the student, um, but um, they can observe the student uh, herself or himself the whole time. Um, and that's how it's usually done. Uh, we've typically had uh, a little bit more technical issues with TABE than with BEST, simply because it takes longer to do. Um, but overall, um, We've, we've had quite a lot of success with administering uh, assessments uh, online um, as long as the student has that main connection, right? So they must have access to internet. And when it comes to tape, uh, the student actually must have either a laptop or a computer with a camera. Um, that's um, the, the tricky piece is that students cannot do a tape test on their cell phone, whereas with Best Plus they can, and there is a lot more flexibility when it comes to that.
So when it comes to uh, the, the future of, of Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy, um, I feel like you, you all have uh, already started a great foundation, which is getting us connected, right? Uh, as much as we, we all think that now during COVID, it's so much easier to connect with everybody because we're all online, there's also a lot of being disconnected in certain ways because we're all busy, right? And we're all trying to, to do things uh, on the ground. So we don't have necessarily as much time as, as we might have had before to, to meet and to discuss things and to dream together. So um, really, I see this office, first of all, to, in continuing to do what, what they do best, and that's bringing the providers together, doing things like these, where we share best practices, we, we share um, challenges as well, right? Uh, simply we share suggestions, right, in, in helping each other um, complement each other, right? Um, so rather than doing the same thing, um, uh, it's, it's, to me, it's all about seeing what exactly do the communities we all serve look like and what do they need? Houston is so diverse, communities are so different. So if we all were to, to offer the same things, we wouldn't be doing our, our neighbors justice. So I see the, this office really as, as, a, um, as kind of like a, a, a joint uh, um, effort of, of everybody to bring us all together and, and discuss where where and how we can complement each other and how we can help cross train each other on, on certain things. Uh, professional development has always been one of my favorite things about uh, this organization. And I really hope that that's going to continue because we all have so much to learn um, in not just in terms of technology and, and how to serve our students, but also in terms of leading and and advocating for for the people that we serve and i i think you know, like uh we mentioned in uh in one of the previous meetings uh, being coming all together as one voice and and getting our message across uh that's gonna be i think the main impact of mole uh in in this covid era um i don't know what post covid looks like right as as you mentioned um this is still kind of going on. We're still reacting to to this thing, right? But I feel like we also are growing stronger, and uh, Mole can definitely help us kind of bring out the best that we've been doing in the field uh, and advertising it publicly so that everybody knows that adult education did not stop for a single moment, that we are all still providing services, that we're working harder than ever because there's no more traffic we need to beat. <laughs> there's nowhere to go. We are all working more than ever to uh, bring these services to our families and to get them to that next step, whatever their goals are, right? Either getting them back to jobs or getting them into post-secondary education, whatever those goals are, right? Um, that's, in short, what I what I hope for uh, in the upcoming period.